welcome you, yeah? Thank you for joining me tonight. Well, thank you for having me, Ebony. I appreciate it. <laughs> I was like, where is he? Where is he? You're there. Um, okay, yeah, thank you for coming in. So do you want to tell us where you're from first in the U.S.? Because, you know, the U.S. is such a big place. I'm uh, in the New York area, or New York, New Jersey area, uh, where I've spent uh, the majority of my my uh, life thus far. So that would be considered the East Coast. Most people know New York. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on an East Coast. I'm a New York person. Okay, lovely. Yeah, I've got some friends in New York. Okay, and the book that you've written, when did you write this book? How long ago was that? Well, actually, the book, um, it was kind of a, a series of, um, I'd say, almost divine inspiration and coincidence uh, over several years and it kind of started off as a very cerebral work in that uh, I just started writing it in my head uh, maybe about um, maybe six seven years ago and it was based off of some things that I had seen in the community uh, I, I guess we'll say some chasms uh, that existed between families and so I started kind of structuring it and uh, the book is a is a it's a narrative it's a fictional narrative but included in between the fictional narrative are various admonitions and lessons and things to kind of be mindful for, full of so it's it's almost kind of like a workbook uh, as well as a narrative um, so the narrative aspect in terms of the characters and their lives and their backstories I probably started creating that uh, some years ago and the book was actually published though uh, about a I think about a year and a half ago something like that you know it's kind of all blends into each other but yeah about a year and a half ago it was actually published okay and so what made you write the book what made you get into this book which is quite a deep um, subject coming up in in what we'll call the conscious or the community of those who are seeking higher or elevated awareness I started to see what I would consider to be an epidemic and that epidemic was uh, we had this this fragmentation that I kept seeing within family models uh, or families who were present at different events or were involved in different workshops, you know, like if I was at a drum class or at a writing workshop or anything that really spoke to experiences and healthy bonding, bonding experiences where people were attempting to reinvest into their culture. I kept seeing this repeated scenario of uh, father there with no wife, wife there with no husband, you know, a father, no child, so forth. But I, I failed to see whole families on a consistent basis. So it caused me to kind of do a little bit of um, observation or, or, you know, observational research for a little while and just kind of sit back and look. And I was trying to understand why was it that there was such this, there was this divide, there was this imbalance. And I began to see that a lot of times uh, people had engaged in relationships and courtships at a time when they were still in, unleashed. They were, they were unleashed in their manhood or unleashed in their womanhood and had not really uh, matured or developed or cultivated uh, their higher awareness or their inner wisdom as of yet and may have made it themselves to someone who was not even interested in those type of pursuits. So as the years went by, maybe children were, were co-created at that point, uh, the, the divide between the two individuals would get even wider. So when it came time for them to share healthy experiences, like again, the dance class, the drum class, martial arts, or you know, just any type of, or lectures and things like that, it was, uh, it was a very divided experience. Uh, so I started to see that as an issue and more so not only just an issue uh, in urban communities, but, uh, or, or communities of people of color, I would say, but I saw it as an issue that no one was speaking on. It was kind of like the elephant in the room, you know, so I figured, well, maybe I should speak on it. And, and that's how the book uh, came forth. And the original title was actually Suicidal Families. Uh, and I had um, that was what it was originally yeah, published under. And I had to change that because it just it was a bit misleading, you know, but I felt that 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 ideology coming into a family was just suicidal. So hence the uh, strength of the title. So um, 
Um, let me try and get the gist of the book. Are you suggesting that, you know, is this aimed at any particular racial group or is it just something that's for everybody? Um, and are you promoting any kind of aspects of togetherness? Are you saying that more people need to be married within, you know, uh, within the marriage relationship in order to have the stability or to move away from the dysfunction that you focus on? Um, or what, what is it? What is the strap line really to the whole whole of the ideals in your book well yes it's not really so much that um i'm advocating marriage uh for one but i actually let me address the first question it's not necessarily ad addressed uh to one particular ethnic group because that is kind of the issue that's highlighted in the book it's the blending of ethnic book uh, groups it's the it's the blending of cultures that creates this sometimes a, a cancerous uh, energy within a household and the book goes into identifying it and of course eradicating it if possible now in terms of the uh, the marital piece uh, the book is not just for people who are currently mar married it really speaks strongly to people who are divorced and they're trying and let's say the children were created got created as a product of the previous marriage and they're trying to come to some form of uh, uh, resolution as to how children be raised. So let's say if, if, you know, I married someone and during the course of that marriage, that person decided that they wanted to, uh, invest into, in, in Buddhism heavily. And I made an investment in, you know, Hebraic culture. So the challenge would be here. How do we, and let's say we then split, but we have a child. So now the child gets pulled in two different directions. There may be certain taboos that are sacred to me, which may not be sacred to my ex-mate or my current mate. And the child develops the schizophrenic personality because it's split and torn. It has dual allegiances and it's split and torn between these divided faces of, of loyalty and, and these divided fronts. So it really speaks to um, not just the marital situation, how do we handle ourselves post-marriage, uh, but especially in particular, how do we handle ourselves when we're coming into a courtship? How is it that we really identify someone who may have goals and, and long-term goals and a cultural acyclic that is aligned with our own, you know, those, those core values, norms, and principles that they're shackled to and they're unchanged, unchanged in, you know, what are the things and the values that we're shackled to and how do we identify those and our mates? Because one of the challenges that we have today is, uh, and this is highlighted in the book is we really, we don't usually have any form of courtship when we meet people, you know, we meet people and if we vibe, then we just start making plans without really understanding that uh, our approach to one another as men and as women are for different reasons. As men, we work from outer to inner. As women, women work from inner to outer. So just the understanding of that ideology that a woman is going to uh, gravitate or be attracted to someone first based on aura and emotions. Not to say that women are not su as superficial as men, because they certainly are, but uh, they're attracted and they'll grasp more into how someone makes them feel. Whereas a man will uh, be magnetized by how someone appears, the shell. And then after they have done <laughs> their, their work with the shell, if afterwards the person possesses certain qualities that show themselves to be friendly, then the man will want to invest further after that. Okay. So just that, un the understanding of that, of that process of how we're drawn to each other energetically, uh, is something that needs to be highlighted in our courtships and also, uh, the purpose and the reasoning for our joining. You know, oftentimes it's just meandering and, and, and purpose, uh, list dating. So, you know, we're just spending enough time with each other until we develop some form of dislike for one another or uh, we, we just grow tired of one another or we just say, OK, you know, it's time that we just move to the next step. But we're not really meeting with each other in the first phases of our joining with purpose and with aim. So this book also covers that as well. Uh, so it's also solutions for proper courting, proper dating, uh, pr the proper rearing of children uh, within a split camp reality and how to join and get on one accord with, with your mate uh, from a cultural perspective as well. Okay. 
So, uh, okay, I want to I want to go back to the whole question of dysfunction and how you define that because I think if you start at the beginning, most people will be thinking, what is, you know, what are you calling dysfunctional in terms of families? What is that whole definition about? Where does that come from? Let's first look at you know um, again purpose because what what we're dealing with here is the absence or the the perversion perversion or the distortion of purpose. Each family has a purpose, you know, or should have a purpose. Uh, bloodlines have a purpose. When you look in indigenous cultures, you'll have situations where certain people in certain areas their their families or their bloodline their lineage has always served a certain role and stood guard on a certain position within their nation or within you know their their clan or with even within the uh, greater family so each family that comes together is a factory unto itself okay whether we're a family of blacksmiths we're a family of engineers we're a family of mathematicians we're a family of psychologists whatever it is each family has a purpose now the challenge comes in when one creates per creates family without a cultivated purpose or clear and transparent purpose uh for instance I advocate that each family should have a mission statement and that mission statement should be somewhere in plain sight in the home, especially at the doors that one would exit out of. So when you leave your threshold every day, you're clear on the principles and the values again that you are to represent and what your overall purpose and aim is and objective in anything that you do. So you're clear on what your lifestyle should re reflect as are your children. What type of lifestyle should, should we manifest and should we explore based on the objective and aims of our family? Now a dysfunctional family, one probably has no mission, but if they do have a mission, the working components and the community of that family, whether even if it's a nuclear family, it's a community unto itself. The components or the individuals are not working on one accord. They have become like um, a, a virus or a cell that turns on itself or a body that has cells that begin to fight itself internally, which then leads to sickness. OK, so that would be a dysfunctional family where one uh, is not on one accord. There's no unity. And of course, if there's no unity, nothing is produced. Yeah, if there's no unity of purpose, definitely. You're not going anywhere. Uh, so I can understand that. I definitely can understand that. Hmm, interesting. I wonder what people think who are listening, you guys who've been listening since the beginning of the show. Uh, we are talking about dysfunction dysfunctional families. And I wonder if you have any points you want to raise to my guest, Yulia who I think has eloquently uh, articulated his views about the topic and, uh, you know, a bit about his book. Um, and, you know, I'm wanting to take some calls if you want to call in. It's 347-945-7556. really got somebody who's holding. But I'm going to let that person hold on a little bit more. So I just want you to explain uh, a little bit about yourself because I understand, you know, where you're coming from. Now I've got an idea of where you're coming from with the book. But how do you fit into your own story? You know, how does your story fit into the book? Do you have a family? Are you married? Is your family, you know, functioning with a purpose of what you talk about? Or is this just for other people? Mm. No, these are definitely principles and values that I hold dear to my heart. Uh, I would say much of my calculation and observation came in my own upbringing and observing the uh, relationship and the way that my parents related to one another, the way my grandparents related to one another, uh, myself and my siblings, how we related to each other, uh, the pride that was instilled uh, in me as a child, you know, certain little phrases that were said, you know, uh, one of the things that my mother used to do when I was younger uh, well, two things. One, you know, whenever she would give me a bath when I was a small child, she would always wrap the towel around my, my waist and say, you know, you're you know, you're an African prince. Right. You know, and she would always say that she would hold me to the mirror with the towel and say, you know, you're a prince. And you couldn't tell me any different. You know, I, I knew I was an African prince based on this bath towel being wrapped around me. And I grew up with that that knowing or, or you know, that that mind mindset based on, again, striving. So when things would, would occur, 
uh, she would always say, well, is that how a prince behaves? Is, is that really what you're supposed to be doing based on, you know, your, your royalty? You know, so small things like that or even how um, sometimes uh, they would make little phrases that rhymed with our last name. You know, um, so there was a sense of teen pride instilled at the very beginning. But uh, again, coming up and of course, here in the States uh, where we have a, an over 60 percent uh, divorce rate, which is steady, steady climbing. Uh, I began to see a lot of uh, dysfunction again within my own community and how uh, males and females related to one another. And it was something that I didn't necessarily want to model. You know, so uh, even the idea of calling one another the opposite sex was something that intrigued me because I would say, you know, well, that means we're opponents based on the etymology of that word. You know, so no wonder we have a battle of the sexes, you know, so I would, be, would begin to use terms like complementary. You know, uh, the one who compliments is the one who can be my mate. You know, so these are principles that I've always uh, applied uh, in my own life and in my own family. And I, I wouldn't call myself married because um, in the Western sense of how we define marriage, uh, I feel that it's a term that's a bit too toxic and feeble uh, for those of us who want something a little healthier. Uh, but I certainly do uh, keep myself in the company of family you know, of people who support me and people who I support them. And we provide a shelter for one another and people who we try to move with one aim and one vision and on one accord. That is certainly something that is uh, very important to me because the family itself will always be the microcosmic representation of what your community is going to be. So if your community is sick, it's because your families are sick. And if your families are sick, it's because the individuals are maligned and sick. So, you know, uh, one of the things that I try to model is healthy forms of uh, family and healthy forms of interdependency within communities. You know, so as far as my personal story, certainly this is not these are not principles, methods or ideologies that are alien uh, to my own legacy or alien to my own upbringing. These are certain certainly ideas and um, that I apply daily and much of what's in the book in terms of uh, practices that are suggested and in all honesty even uh, some of the narratives are loosely <laughs> um, based off of my own experiences in my own life you know so I just took a lot of my good healthy experiences and extrapolated them in some senses and offered that to the community in certain forms well, I suppose my, my concern would be is that, you know, particularly looking, you know, I can only talk about the UK, really, because I can't speak for the US, but I, I guess the situation's very similar there, that, you know, there are very few people who are getting together. I know you say marriages are toxic, but, you know, that unit is what we, that unit is what we recognise um, as a unit that probably brings some sort of stability in relationships. But we're not getting much of that now. Are you saying that we should replace that with something else? Because, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what your unit that you would call the, the life that you're involved in. And I don't want to get too much into your personal stuff, but I'm saying, you know, people who are trying to learn and maybe want to look for good examples, uh, you know, will be, be looking in the book to find out what is it can I do that I should be looking for. Should I be looking... You know, to establish a marriage, or do I go into these relationships that may be polyandry type relationships, or what are you advocating? Or maybe you're not advocating anything particular, but what would you suggest where people should lean um, in terms of looking for stability? Because if we want to move from dysfunction, we want to move to something that, that is stable and secure in some sense. And I'm just not sure what it is you're saying or suggesting we should be looking for. Sure. Uh, well, first, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating any one system of union, but I would I would advocate and I am advocating that we take a hard look at the terms that we've used, that we've just adopted, especially those of us who are melanated or those of us who come from um, indigenous roots. Uh, and many of these terms have been handed to us. And in all honesty, when we were first encountered uh, by colonialists, our marital systems were stripped from us because they were part of our our power bases. So I, I would say in this time, it's it's 
it's critical that we really look at the terms that we use when we use when we say, okay, I want to get married, I want a husband, I want a wife. Well, how many people really understand what wifery is or what it is to be a bondsman, which is the same thing as a husband, and understanding that the husband is the one who holds the deed for for every piece of property that's on his on his homestead, including his cattle and including his wife. So, you know, uh, understanding these terms and understanding the paradigm that's associated with these terms, even if we want to say, well, you know what, I use that word, I use this, but I, I, I mean this. But there's a there's an energetic, um, it's, it's kinetic motion, you know, and there's an energetic movement that's associated with certain terms. For instance, marriage. Marriage, when you even look at the term, uh, as beautiful as certain indigenous languages are, I really don't think we would come up with the word that sounds like mar in order to speak to uh, us joining together and creating family with one another. It's such a hard and uh, rough sounding word. So, you know, some of the things we, if we just start looking at what do they actually mean and, and do we all need the same thing in marriage? Should marriage be a uniform uh, construct globally? Is marriage uh, globally universal or based on my community needs or maybe even my, my ethnic origins or my ancestral legacy and my historical challenges as well as, well as my historical strengths? Should marriage or union or partnerships and agreements look different for me based on who I am? And I think uh, many communities of power that exist globally, they have that understanding or they've come to that understanding or they practice that understanding. But those of us who are still um, running around in the dark, banging our head against walls, uh, we haven't really realized that oftentimes we're trying to establish something that was dysfunctional from the beginning and wasn't really based on community building, wasn't really based on functionality or spiritual growth or personal development but was based on a political or financial agenda uh, it's very similar to how um, uh, there's a phrase where people say that prostitution is the oldest business well the question would be the oldest business for who and what cult and what culture and what country is prostitution the oldest business you know or the understanding even when you look at ancient grecian and roman culture that these were these were cultures that were primarily uh homosexual and pedophiliac so just based on that understanding if i don't come from a culture that's primarily homosexual and pedophiliac would we share the same understanding of children would we share the same understanding of how we join together and why we join together in union so a lot of the um, practices that we've taken on, you know, and I, I spoke to the words uh, because that's kind of like level one. That's base one that we need, to, we need to look at. But even the practices that are associated with these marital systems, uh, which are primarily governed uh, by the state, uh, a lot of the practices are toxic. And we haven't looked at that yet. You know, carrying your wife through the threshold is one that's often done in, in, in weddings here. And one does not a lot of times look at that the reason that is is because symbolically in ancient times the wife would be stolen so that that actually emulates that act it's actually an honor to those ancestors who used to do that act just like uh, in certain weddings they throw rice at the couple but well, actually what that was in ancient times that represented the families of the bride who would throw rocks at the groom to try to retain their bride to retain their child back because the child would be stolen so these are symbolic practices. And of course, you might say, yeah, but it doesn't mean maybe you're going too deep into this. It doesn't mean that when I do it, it means something else. And I just want a white wedding and this and that and that. But when you're re- mm -hmm. I'm just saying, we know, OK, I hear what you're saying. I'm just saying, then what do you suggest people use as that unit, you know, to, to stabilize the unit? Because it's like. Do we just then have relationships that aren't about marriage, or do we have do we have relationships based on agreements? What kind of agreements are you saying that people should make, and how do we enforce those agreements? You know, by law, or how should it be? Because if you're going to say, well, okay, you're kind of dismissing that on for whatever reasons, and I agree with some of the reasons you've given, and I've heard some of them before. What replaces that is my question. You know, what replaces that? Right. Like at the moment, I know what, what you say what replaces sure. that. 
Right. I was definitely getting to that. Well, the thing is, first, I wanted to highlight that those practices are are originate with a certain culture. So what replaces it is your cultural rituals, your cultural rights. So there's no one. That's why I said it's it's not a universal or global thing. I can't say, well, everyone needs to practice this form of marriage. That's actually what we're doing now. And it doesn't work. What we need to look at first off, and before we even look at that, we need to first look at the individual. Am I functional? Is my internal community in one accord and healthy and functioning? Because if not, then all I'm going to do, marriage is only going to amplify that dysfunction. It's only going to spread it further now throughout the community. So the first thing one needs to do is to spiritually, physically, emotionally, and metaphysically get themselves in order. And once they can do that, then they can attract or they can create a, a healthier situation based on their personal cultural imperatives. Uh, one of the subtitles for the book is a healing from the aftermath of cross-cultural relationships. And the reason why I use that term is because when you have two cultures, let's say if you come from a, one culture, I come from another, and you and I decide um, that we're, we want to get together, we want to join a union. Well, what's going to happen, unless we're able to assimilate some type of new culture, if we try to force these two cultures to exist within the same space, they're going to fight for dominance. One is going to fight for dominance and one is going to end up being the dominant and one is going to be end up being the recessive because there's no co-leadership in cultures. So what happens is the recessive will always resent the dominant. And this right there creates an inner tension and turmoil within the house. So, again, the key thing where we begin at is determining what our cultural imperative should be now. In terms of, okay, well, should this be in, how do we get together? What do we call it? Well, you, the reality is it's your agreement. Marriage is something that's ordained by God. Now, I'm using the term God for conceptual references, but I understand that everyone has their own word. But you understand what I mean when I say the creator, the supreme being. It's something that's ordained first. The joining, even for those who are Christians listening, you were told to be fruitful and multiply. Okay, so that's not something that the state or quote unquote man's law gave you God gave you that right that ordination first to multiply and to get together what we end up doing is we say well how do we enforce this you enforce this through your your divine morality now I know many people will say well but you can't trust that you can you know people things change well then perhaps you don't need to be marrying that person okay so one of the challenges again is when we allow alien ideologies to intrude and invade on our systems of joining together what we call it maybe you know i might just say hey this is my woman and she might say this is my man that's it or we might we might say we're married this is my wife this is my husband so forth so on but it has to be in alignment with your cultural and your your ethnic origins and physiognomy or you're going to be constantly trying to fit yourself into a place where you do not belong. Now, are there legal repercussions? Certainly. Uh, and I'm not saying that people should not uh, engage in legal marriage, though I will say I am against it. And and the reason being is because now you're you're having the state or, or um, the parliament uh, certify something that you have the natural and divine right to do. And once they certify it, they can control it. So you have to ask permission, like you have to get a marriage permit. You have to ask permission to join and do something that you were given the right to by your God. And then you have to ask the permission to part ways and to, and to move further into another space in your life. Something that you were also allowed to do divinely by your God. You have to ask permission of these things by a fictitious entity called the state. So that's one of the reasons why we have a such such a high divorce rate, because the state becomes a third party member. It becomes like an orgy and the state becomes a third party member within your marital structure. So one of the things that we can do, we can always write signed. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that's that's kind of uh, complicated because it depends on what the dysfunction is. There's various expressions of dysfunction. You know, one person may have a drug addiction. You know, and they may have a drug addiction because of their family upbringing. So that you may they may have to go back to their hometown to try to repair that. So it really it really depends, you know. But um, 
ultimately, uh, a lot of times it's instincts. You know, we, we've like lost our ability to rely on our masculine instincts and our feminine instincts. And because of that, uh, we really don't know how to relate to one another. We don't know how to communicate with each other in ways that are effective because the answer that would lie for a male is certainly different for a female and vice versa. You know, so it, it, I would say it, it really depends on what the actual issue is. You want to give me, you want to make up something? <laughs> give me a, uh, uh, imaginary scenario. Well, no, I wouldn't want to make a I wouldn't want to make a man right now. Okay. I, would just, I would just say. It's a real one, Joe. You know something? Can I ask him a question? Dear Sorry. God. Isn't you the one who wrote the book? And you've given the insight on the dysfunctional marriage. And maybe in your, in your research and your studies, or in your travels, you may have come across some of the... Um, the reasons for a dysfunctional marriage um, that may have been pretty common throughout the rest of the um, dysfunctional marriages, and maybe you can use um, one of them as an example. Well, can I give sure. you an example? Well, you know, um, yeah. Can I give you an example? Okay, sure. What about, I come across you so many people now who are in loveless relationships, okay? You know, where they're living with someone, it's going on, you know, year to year, and there is no uh, real love there yet you know for different reasons people stay in those relationships now that's kind of obviously dysfunctional in a sense but in another sense they're kind of i think people get wedded to the idea that you've got to keep it going regardless because change is so hard uh you know stepping out of that and uh you know and creating a dysfunction by leaving if you know what i mean because then you have a family that's disjointed although it's disjointed <laughs> because there's no love there but the fact is there are people in a unit that look like or appear to be doing what it says on the tin now if someone decides to break that and move away from it and say well okay there's no love here you know let's end it you're then creating a problem because the people in that unit, particularly the children, I guess, will then, uh, you know, have a reality check as to what the re what is really happening. So you, you're kind of trying to step away from something dysfunctional, but you're also creating something dysfunctional by moving on. You know, how would you address that? And have you addressed that in your book in any shape or form? Sure. You know, well... The, the first thing I think, and of course, that's, you know, we know that's a common one that speak, people speak on, you know, loveless relationships. But the challenge with that one is people who marry for love. You know, if you're marrying for love, then you're in trouble because that's not why you should marry someone. Uh, number one, uh, and I'll, I'll address that because I have a feeling you're going to get me to wrap that back around. But, um, the other issue with that is how do we define what love is and how do we define how love is expressed? You know, um, I had a situation once with a woman who I was I was working with and she was married for a year. And after the first year, she was ready to uh, gather herself up, herself up a, 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 a lover outside of the marriage. And I kept saying, well, why is this something you want to do? She said, because my husband doesn't really love me. And I said, well, tell me, you know, how, how it is you came to that conclusion? And she said, because like every day when I get up to go out to go to work, my son, who at the time was uh, about 13, he always says, mommy, you look so beautiful. You dress so nice. Oh my God, mommy, you look so good. And she said her new husband never said that to her at all. So that's how she defined that this man has no love for her, okay, because he was devoid of ego strokes that she obviously trained her son to have, um, you know, since he was he was an, a toddler, probably, you know. Um, so a lot of times when we say things like I'm in a loveless relationship, it's very difficult to ascertain that from the outside. When we look at it, um, sometimes a loveless relationship can be defined as an affectionless relationship or someone feels like they're not being nurtured or they're not being understood or they they want to be accepted which is usually the most common one when they say i'm in a loveless relationship a lot of times people come into situations with some serious character flaws 
And now that they're married, they expect to be able to nestle those flaws within the fabric of that actual marriage. And when they're unable to do that, when the person says, no, you know what? You can't have that here. You can't be that in this space. We're going to have to work towards some improvement and some growth. Then they say, this person doesn't love me for who I am. I'm in a loveless relationship. What, a, what about if there's no intimacy in the relationship? Because a lot of people feel if I get together with someone on a long term, okay, and I make my marriage vows, and it's in the marriage vows, okay, <laughs> okay, um, that you agree to give your body over to that person. Uh, I'm sorry, that's what you say. So if there's no intimacy, would you say that's not a love less, you know, that there's no love in the marriage? Yeah, but that's not love. <laughs> intimacy doesn't equate to that at all. Uh, if there's no intimacy, you know, a, a lot of times, and this is something that's, um, I, I know I, a lot of times for women, it's difficult for them to hear this one. But a lot of times your husband is just not attracted to you. You know, he may have been in the beginning, but things change after a while. And it's really hard for him to express that he's no longer attracted to you. You know, because a lot of times when you hear complaints of, of, of a lack of intimacy, it's the woman saying he's not laying with me anymore. Sometimes he's just found another lover. You know, there's so many different reasons for that. But that that actually has nothing at all to do with a lack of love, because it's very rare that a man who's not having sex with a woman will leave her because of that. Although the flip is is uh, not necessarily the same. You know, so um, a lack of, of sexual contact certainly does not uh, equate to a lack of intimacy or a lack of love. Uh, sometimes intimacy is not recognized on, on other levels or people don't realize how they're turning each other off. Some things that we think are cute because now we're joined together and we have papers on one another. So now we can kind of just let go and men can do things like burp at the table and pass gas and all of these things that are disgusting that they feel, okay, well now I'm, it's, it's comfortable now. I can do these things. They don't actually realize, well, you're actually slowly turning off your mate and vice versa. You know, um, one of the things that we don't strive for, unfortunately, a lot of times in relationships, we don't strive to be liked. You know, the stress is too much on love. And the reality is love grows over time. Over time, you'll grow to love someone and you'll, you'll develop a deep rooted, real love, authentic love. But in the beginning, you need to strive to be liked by the person. And this is something we usually only do in the, in the beginning stages of our dating. You know, we'll wear certain things, we'll say certain things, we'll go to certain places, we'll, tr we'll aim and strive to be interesting. We'll aim and strive to be sexy or intriguing or to have a certain mystique about us. And then once we put papers or usually when we tell each other we love each other, that's the beginning of the end. Once we say that, everybody gets lazy. The, my the mystique is gone. You know, no one's putting on cologne and perfume anymore. No one cares anymore. You know, uh, so a lot of times the lack of intimacy is because um, people are not striving to be liked anymore. They just feel that love is a, a bridge that is a self-regenerating and self-sustaining bridge that will carry them through. Okay. A lot of truth there. Absolutely agree with you. So where do you, where does the dysfunction begin in that example that I gave you? Or is there any dysfunction in it? Or do you just see that as a normal relationship? The dysfunction begins uh, with an earlier identity crisis that occurred before the two people we even met. Okay, uh, once you kind of you understand your identity in the face of uh, your community, in the face of your current family, and of course in the face of your your God or whoever you you know or the universe, then you understand more what your function and role should be within a union. You know, uh, for instance, out here, you know, in the states. We have a very gynocentric um, dating or relationship format, meaning that it's very feminine based. OK, so um, basically, when two people get together in a relationship, uh, when you get with a woman, you're supposed to be like her girlfriend. OK, and you're supposed to cry with her and watch the movies, certain movies with her and go shopping with her and all of these different things that are steadily stripping you of your masculinity. So what happens now is when you try to invoke that masculine energy and say, okay, now it's late night and, you know, we can get into some fun. It's gone. 
you, you know, you're not able to even do things like sustain erections because you've been acting like a girl all week. You know, so um, the dysfunction really begins with that earlier identity crisis of who and what you're supposed to be. For instance, there's nothing more appealing than a woman who's standing on the conviction of a purpose with true sensuality. OK, not sexuality, but sensuality. Now, that, that's a very um, mysterious thing that women have that we men shouldn't really understand. We shouldn't know why you guys look so good when we're getting ready to go out somewhere. We shouldn't really know that, you know, or why we get so excited when you're standing in front of us uh, at the end of the night and taking your clothes off, getting ready for bed. We shouldn't know why that's so appealing to us. These are part of the female secrets that you guys are supposed to have. And in the same instance, you're not supposed to know what kind of mechanical problems we're having with our vehicles and what we have to do to remove an alternator out of a truck and things like that. It breaks down the mystique of us just showing up, fixing your car and saying here and, and handing the keys to you. That's much, you know, more sexier than breaking down the mystique in the walls of what makes me a man and the mysterious, subtle things that allows me to be man and allows you to be woman. And that being of uh, your gender assignment has been lost. That being, you know, um, we're not in our proper role. So therefore we're not really, um, we're not attractive to one another anymore as a whole. Uh, I wanted to, to agree with you. Anybody out there who wants to join the conversation, my, my chat room is very quiet. Normally these guys are buzzing, but they, it sounds like they're listening to you tonight and learning. That's got to be a good thing. So welcome to everyone who joined me uh, since I said hello to you. Um, Galactic Scientist, uh, it's Real Talk Radio. All the guests that are on there, 309 one three zero nine four three zero nine nine three one one five. Welcome, guys. And East Coast, hi, welcome to the show. And Michelle, I, I don't know, I think I missed Michelle earlier, but thank you for joining me. Um, now, someone in the chat room said, I love the way the concept of making your family's vision clear and concise. Uh, okay, so I think Cloud Nation Radio is saying that you're on point, and he likes the concept of making your family's vision clear and concise. So uh, that that's very good. Someone who agrees okay, that needs to be that vision, that person. Tonight, in Evans Real Talks, we are talking about dysfunctional families, and I'm speaking to Yuya, who's the author of a great book called Solutions for Dysfunctional Family Relationships. Oh, that's a bit of a mouthful. So we've been talking since the top of the hour, really, about what you know, where he's coming from and the whole question of dysfunctionality in families. And we've been talking about marriage and how, uh, you know, each of us may see or view or our perceptions of what marriage should be or relationships should even be about. So I have learned so much, you yeah, from the beginning of the show to listening to you. Um, and I think people have really been listening tonight because normally I get a lot of people calling in and wanting to say stuff. But I think we have a listening audience and that's got to be a great thing. So I hope people go out and buy your book. Where is your book if people want to find the book? Sure. Uh, people can go to anu-bookstore.com. That's A-N-U-B-O-O-K-S-T-O-R-E. Dot com and they can get the book from there. Okay. Can you also get it on Amazon? Yes. Uh, yep. The book is also available on Amazon. You can either search my name, which is Yuya, Y-U-Y-A, Asan, A-S-S-A-A-N, hyphen, Anu, A-N-U. So that's Yuya, Asan, Anu, and you can uh, check out all of, all of my titles. Uh, including solutions for dysfunctional family relationships. Okay, that's great. Now, before the break, I did say I wanted to kind of move the conversation on to talk about uh, those aspects of the book which are about family. So, you looking at single moms raising young males. I know that is something that a lot of people like to talk about particular community about, you know, what a bad job to men do raising young men. Um, but, you know, I have my views. I have my views, but I want to hear yours. 
and how you address it in the book, most importantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, of course, that certainly is a, a touchy topic. Uh, in, in the communities today and part of the reasons you know part of the reasons why it's so touchy is because we're actually seeing the product of that experiment of uh, the attempt of females to raise uh, males to manhood which um, in my calculations is impossible uh, one can take care of a young man of a, of, or of a male you know a female can take care of a, ma- of a male uh, but caretaking and rearing are two different things you know there are certain um, life lessons and there's certain information that males only process and assimilate from other males there's only two primary ways of learning that uh, us men you know when we even when we become men that we learn we learn from trial and error that's very important for us trial and error we got to get our bumps and bruises and we learn from other men who are further down the path than we are that's it you know uh so that's again something that's not often instilled or or even a lot of women even know unfortunately uh so they'll be trying and trying and and racking their heads against the wall trying to figure out why won't this boy listen uh because he's not wired his chemistry is not wired to hear it from you you know, so um, the ideal of a woman raising uh, a male to the point of manhood, certainly not. And I think this is one of the reasons why. Well, not even think. I know this is one of the key reasons why we had th- we have this proliferation of adult boys in our communities today. Uh, those who are masquerading themselves as men, but have the um, the mindset and even the aura. <laughs> And the reasoning capabilities of young boys, they have the same vices, you know, they could be 50 years old, but have the same vices as a 15 year old, listen to the same music, wear the same clothes, or trying to have sex with the same girl, you know, uh, because they have never really been properly raised to the maturation of manhood. So that would be my take on it. I think that's interesting. That is interesting. Because I think if we go back, right, um, you know, we when this kind of started uh, I know that you know in the oh where do you start because I guess the history is different in the US to the UK and what I do know is the UK more so but in the UK I'd say you know if we look at sort of the 50s 60s you know 70s maybe it started to change 80s more so change but way back you know it, anybody who's around 40 to 50 right now probably was brought up you know in the uk brought up with both parents in the home it may have changed later on you know a lot of people split up later on but in order to survive in the uk a lot of the unit you know a lot of families were dependent on each other it you know in the 50s and a lot of people stayed long-term marriages so you know now we know that because you know i'm always been invited to people who are doing their 60 years or their 40 years or 50 years of marriage okay different for our generation not many people are staying so what i'm what i'm trying to find out is when did the disconnect happen in the messages about what it takes to be a man so if there were you know if you had men brought up in uh you know with fathers who are now in their 70s or 80s if they made it okay 60s 70s or 80s who are still married um you know, even if they didn't stay in marriages, uh, you know, as the next generation, where did the disconnect come in terms of understanding the responsibility of, of you know, of being a father or being a man? Because I, I don't really talk by that conversation. You know, it is, you know, that these people have disconnected because at some point there were those relationships intact. And I just want to know where, where it stopped, what happened. Because for me, in the UK, I, I hear that, but I kind of hear that, to me, it feels like an excuse for some people to kind of say, well, actually, you know, uh, you know, because we were raised by women. Uh, how many men were raised by women? Maybe in the US, it's a different situation. But here in the UK, there are a lot of people that were raised by their fathers. A lot of men that were raised by their fathers. And they're just, just as bad as <laughs> people who weren't raised. You get what I'm saying? So I'm just wondering, yes, is it, are you talking about what you've seen in the U.S.? Is, are there stats about that? Or, you know, at what point 
that the change will happen that you're talking about. This is a global phenomenon. I mean, this is not just something that uh, has has wiped through the U.S., but what we're speaking about is where this breakdown began was with the introduction of colonialism. And with the introduction of colonialism, when industry was removed out of the family unit, uh, again, like I said earlier, each each family uh, in indigenous cultures, and many indigenous, I can't just say one, uh, was seen as a factory unto itself. So once that was removed, the ability to actually support one's own economy, okay, an economy just meaning eco means life, and nominee or namo means the homestead. So economy just means the life of the homestead. So when one was no longer able to facilitate and cultivate the life of their homestead, they began to feel and to see, uh, or it was forced upon them, a disconnect with their, their gender orientation, responsibility, and assignment. Okay, so uh, it didn't just happen because even if we were to say, okay, it happened in the 80s or the 60s and the 70s, who allowed it to happen? Clearly, there must have been some form of insanity that our grandparents were also suffering from. It just manifested itself differently. And like with most things, unless they're stopped, they're only going to get worse. You know, and I go back again to when culture was stripped through the process of colonialism, then the understanding of rites of passage of how we define manhood, of how we define womanhood was stripped. So for instance, many people will say, well, there's a lot of women raising uh, young boys. Well, who's to say that they're women? How do you know that those are not adult girls? And I will say from, from what I've observed, oftentimes there are, just like there's a shortage of real men, there's just, just the same shortage of real women. And, and it's very easy in a society to receive, right? So we receive tags and definitions and benchmarks from a sick society as to when we come to our place of maturation. And it's false. It's fictitious. And they know it's fictitious when they give it to you. And therefore, uh, the dis disconnect continues to, you know, promote further. But it started way back when we were first colonized and stripped of our culture whether it was, you know, by various cultures. So I'm not just pointing one finger. All right. So I've got someone who wants to come in, Michelle from Australia. Michelle, welcome to the show. Hello, Ebony. Hello, uh, guest. Sorry. Hi. Um, Hello. Yuya. Uh, Yuya. Yuya. Sorry, Yuya. Um, it's an interesting conversation. And um, what I've, I've, I have... Um, I'm interested in what you has to say. I have made some observations over the last 10 years of my own um, watching my family and friends raise their sons. I personally don't have a daughter, but um, what I've noticed is, uh, and this is not necessarily single mothers, this is mothers in uh, reach. What I've noticed is a sort of unhealthy focus on the male son. Um, from the mother, meaning that it's, they become almost obsessional about their, their son and it's usually um, sons who are raised without brothers and sisters so they're on their own um, and the husband actually not having much input at all, um, not emotionally, not in a disciplinary way, not, not in any real sort of concrete way except perhaps to bring in some money and and do the jobs around the house and things like that. But in terms of the intimacy, what I see mothers and doing is um, well, helicopter mums. But it's it's where the mother is just always on the child all the time, um, managing their relationships with other children. You know, telling them what to say. But I see it even more intensely. You know, the intimacy between the mother and the son is so sort of strong. The son stays in the the marital bed for, you know. <laughs> years beyond they should be, things like that. And I'm just wondering if this is something I'm only observing because I don't have a son, if this is a normal kind of thing, or is this a, is this something that you have seen as well? I mean, I, I just am quite fascinated by it, and, and not allowing their sons to go out and take risks and do all those things, whereas I see girls being raised very differently in that um, we give them much more scope for independence, we let them go a lot more. It's sort of reverse, in reverse of what it used to be like um, in more traditional ways of raising children, where, you know, the, the, the girl was... 
the girl was coveted in the household and the male was allowed to just go and do whatever he needed to do, whereas I'm seeing the opposite. Um, I've certainly not raised my daughter that way and I've, I've raised her to be very independent, to be very sort of manage her own emotions, manage her own relationships, make mistakes, take risks. But I see boys being really coveted and, and I'm just wondering if that's, if anyone else has noticed that or am I just reading too much into it or, you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, did you want to comment? I was just going to say one sure. thing before you comment was that in the UK, I think there's now a, a real... I, we, I don't see what you're talking about, Michelle. That may be an Australian thing. I don't know. But what I do see is that a lot of women are protective of their sons because there's so much male violence amongst men. And, um, you know, there is, I guess, with there not being that two-person family like there was before, um, what we do see as women is, you know, uh, real stress um, around, you know, what can we, what can you expose your son to? Because if you send, allow your son to go out and do everything that he should do, he may not come back. <laughs> okay. That's the reality for most of us in the UK. That particularly, uh, you know, there, there, there are so many stabbings uh, and stuff that happens between young men because I think as well the dysfunctionality around not understanding their role, not being able to articulate their anger or deal with, you know, and express themselves positively. Uh, you know, some of those young people, um, if they're not raised properly and maybe if your child's raised properly, properly and they have to go amongst them, the fear is that, you know, that they're going to be absorbed um, by their peers or they may be killed by their peers. So I see a lot of fear. Um, but I think it's not unjustified because, you know, society is quite a difficult place for young boys, particularly black boys in the UK. We have a real issue, um, mm. you know. I don't know, Yuya, what do you think? Because you're, you're looking more globally. What would be your comment? I would say that what Michelle, what you've uh, noticed, I would certainly say I've noticed the same thing. And it, there's a couple of things. Again, we go back to cultural imperatives and ethnic origins to kind of understand why this phenomenon has occurred. Uh, it, it, and there's two important examples, I think, in history that kind of help us to understand what's happening here. And one, I'm going to take the term mentor. Okay, a lot of people know what a mentor is, as someone who guides and helps you and counsels you, so forth and so on. And in traditional times, uh, if anyone ever gets an opportunity to read uh, the book, The Odyssey by Homer, um, there was a there was a character in the book by the name of Mentaris. And Mentaris was the close friend of Odysseus, who was the main character. And his he what happened was when Odysseus went on his journey, he went on a far journey. Uh, he left his son in in the charge of Mentaris. OK, now this was an ancient Grecian ritual or just a part of the, the culture. And what the you had this person who was called it was actually a title, a mentorist. And that would be like your best friend or someone who was in, you know, any type of society club with you. And we're talking about amongst men now. And what he would do was he would take your your son to the gymnasium. Now, gymnasium is a Greek word that means naked. So he would take your son to the gymnasium and he would rape him. And in raping him, what he would do is he would instill respect for the patriarchal authority that was in the state at that time. OK, so this is how they would keep the young boys docile and keep them from rising up. OK, so this was always a a imperative. Now, again, you know, I'm speaking about Grecian culture because Grecian culture being the mother culture of the Western culture that we are all now uh, to some degree subject to. So that's one example I would give. And another one, which is a very common one, especially here uh, in this part of the world, is the one of the Willie Lynch, the Willie Lynch uh, concept. We have what's called the Willie Lynch letter, for those who are familiar with it. And this was basically just a letter written uh, by a, a slave maker. And he was outlining some out some ta some tactics that he used in order to keep his his enslaved Africans docile and more importantly to keep the system of enslavement a regenerative one okay and what he what he did was he he basically directed all of his techniques to the mother 
because he said that if you can control the mother, if you can get the mother to come under this program and in this plan, then what she'll do is she'll teach it to the child. One of the examples of what he used to do, and and, and this was ha this used to happen in what they call the Breaker Islands, which are uh, these are islands uh, right around Jamaica. They would take a, a pregnant woman and they would uh, tie her upside down by her ankles and they would gather all the other pregnant women around and they would gather, gather all the men around and the slave maker of that plantation would take a machete and cut her belly open and the unborn child would fall onto the ground and he would stomp the head of the child. He would stomp it dead. Now what this would do was that this would instill fear in all of the unborn children because their nervous system would be connected to their mothers and and before they would even come out, they would have this inherent fear of the slave maker. OK, so um, this whole ideology of I have to covet and protect my my boys and I can't allow them to go out and experience the roughness and the harshness that comes with manhood is something that was instilled a very long time ago. And that that perpetual need and imperative for society to squash and quell the, t the testosterone and the manly um, uh, expressions of young men. This is not a this is not a new thing, and certainly it's global because if you have um, young men who are informed and they're intelligent and they have test testosteronic expressions, then what's going to happen is they're going to begin to question the powers that be and maybe even look to take them over. Okay, so um, certainly what you're seeing, Michelle, is something that comes from a much older root. But it may be so different because how do, you, how do you build leaders for the future? If you, you know, where are you going to get that male leadership? How do you nurture it and foster it and support it? Um, you know, girls, those four you young girls in the future will have no real men in their homes. It's not going to happen. Leaders, leaders are forged through trial. So you, you can't, leaders are not forged uh, sitting at home watching TV on Fridays. When you look at the great leaders of our past, whether it be in, in your community, outside of your community, you never hear about their home life. You don't hear about how Malcolm X was at home or, or Marcus Garvey or that he liked to play this board game or checkers. You don't hear those type of stories. You only see what they did when they were outside of the home. So that level of exploration and hunting and maybe even going out and getting scarred and getting into fights is what forges a real leader. And when you try to cushion and insulate your child from that, you'll have nothing but an adult male or an effeminized adult male who is basically worth very little he's now a problem in the community because he's imposterine can i just um i just wanted to make a couple of observations and, and again I, I am talking from an australian perspective but i suspect this is a, a global thing as well particularly in western cultures um what i've noticed as well is this pervasive underlying um attitude towards men as as being ineffective as being um sort of dumb as being um really not taken seriously and that's communicated through entertainment it's communicated within our families i mean the fact that we don't let our boys out to make their own decisions and manage their own uh, relationships with other children and experience those things what that communicates to is that you're a boy you don't actually have the ability to do that and um and so for me this is really damaging and i think this is communicated cross-culturally I, I don't think this is just a, a one culture thing but if i can just um compare say to um a culture that ex for example that exists in the northern european areas like for example switzerland i i actually did a an exchange with a family. My family went to stay with a Swiss, in a Swiss home and a Swiss family came and stayed in my home. And so they got to um, be part of our community here and I got to be part of their community over there. And there was a very stark difference in how families were organised, how they talked and treated each other, their attitudes, and all of that was very, very different in that it's a much more egalitarian family 
structure there. And when I was there, I didn't feel the macho male culture and yet men seemed much more masculine to me. I didn't feel that feminine, like that feminine, you must be a certain look way, act in a certain way to be female. And yet I felt the fe women were very feminine there. It's a very hard way thing to describe. And the children were very independent. They were very um, thoughtful. They were very intelligent. They, they spoke well with the family. They were encouraged to talk. Um, they were given, you know, um, those challenges that, that you just talked about. And I found things, there was a respect and a trust there that I don't feel is a cultural norm here amongst family members. And in fact, I've never felt safer myself as a woman in a culture. I felt so safe, not just physically, but emotionally, psychologically, all of it. I felt very safe around the men and the women in that culture. And it was really, really different. And they don't have a conversation about what is a man, what is a woman. Um, they have, a, it's, a, it's much more human based. It's much more based on different attributes. Like I can't explain it so much, but they're not hung up. They're not hung up like we are. And, um, and I... Maybe they're just doing it. Yeah, Maybe they're just, just doing it. it. That's right. <laughs> and and but the, you know the, the level of trust is really hard to uh, is, is really hard to explain. The level of trust there was between men and women was really very noticeable, and yet they didn't really understand when I talked to them about what I what I noticed. They didn't really understand what I was saying. To them, that was just how we that's just how we do things. So well, they couldn't really they Michelle. didn't really get it. Yeah. Yeah, Michelle, I'm going to ask you this, if you ever noticed this, that if you're dating a guy, because you're single, you know, singles, we know this, okay. So when you're dating a guy that hasn't had, had a male role in his, in his life, that you can almost tell straight away in the way that he responds and the way that, he, you know, he interacts with you, there is that little <laughs> disconnect somewhere there that you do notice, you know, and I think it's when it, you know, I, and I don't know if you say you have to, you know, because women always say, I want a man to get in touch with his feminine side and all the rest of it, and it needs to be connected on all those levels. But there is a distinct difference between, uh, you know, a man who understands his role as a man and is totally comfortable in it, and a man who doesn't seem to be very clear and is try still trying to work it out almost in a relationship. And, that, and that's something I just, it just literally just came to me. Yeah. Where I think about a couple and I, of people I've met, it is so clear, the difference. And it's deeper than that. I think it's a man, yeah. men, some men just don't understand their role full stop. Not comfortable, don't really, not comfortable in their own skins, not comfortable in their own position in the world or whatever it might be. And, you know, I think that's what we've raised. We have raised that um, as a culture. I think, Feminism, and you know, I'm going to get stumped all over for saying this, but you know, I think we've gone too far with the female feminism perspective, and um, and we've sort of we've gone too far with it, and this is kind of like the the backlash, if if you could say it that way. Um, you know, it, perhaps what's happening now is it's you know recognition of all of this, and maybe a movement back to more balanced. Um, perspective on things um, where both male and female can reclaim um, their respective and respected places um, in how we are in the world and not one because right now you know the male is not seen to be on an equal par with the woman and but in the opposite direction and um, and I think that's going to have to, the scale will have to come back again and we'll need to balance it out maybe that's where we're heading so, I don't know, I'm just yeah, thinking out loud. Yeah, saying, and I guess that's N2, high N2, welcome to the show. Um, he's saying it's actually much easier to tell a woman who didn't have a man figure in her life, like night and day. I think that's true as well for women. I think, you know, if you didn't have a, a, a strong I, a father figure in your life, then it does show up in, in some of your behaviours. Um, I know that my dad was very much, uh, I would say, a man's man, okay, <laughs> um, and it, and in a way, it's made me always look for someone who is 
totally in charge in a certain sense. It, you know, it's the kind of man that I look for, and, and it's difficult to move away from that because I have seen a man completely run his home and be the man. Okay, uh, you know, he was a leader, he was a provider, he did everything he needed to do, and he was always someone that we could go to as well. But he played his role, and he still does, right? He, you know, he's the anchor. My mom isn't the anchor of the home, <laughs> you know, and, and and so if you if you have been in that kind of relationship and grown up in that relationship, it's very difficult to relate to the man who doesn't have that foundation, doesn't understand how to be a man in that kind of way. It's difficult. I guess that's why they say women marry their fathers. I oh, know. Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, it's interesting that when when I'm around my father, I I slip into the culture, his culture, which is <laughs> he's the king. <laughs> we all mill about him yeah. and get him things and do things for him. But I do it unconsciously. I don't do it with a conscious like I'm doing it. I'm not doing it because he is the king. I'm just doing it because that's just the cultural expectation, and I'm fine with that. But that's not really how I feel inside. If I was to be conscious and thought about it, it would be probably different. But that's just the way it is in his household, and and I'm happy to defer to that. I don't even think about it really. Um, but that's how it is. You know, he he gets waited on, he gets looked after, and you know, and the women do that. That's what that's what it yeah. is. Yeah. But that's because you've seen it as a natural part of him being a man in that home. So yeah. you wouldn't want to come in and be different because it's naturally done. There is no thinking about it. There's no stress around it. It just happens. Yeah. And that's with my dad. It just happens. So we go in and we just yeah. fall into the same role. Right? Yeah, and the exactly. Same thing. exactly. So it's not yeah. hard. So it, it's because you've had that foundation and that's the way it's always right. been and it's a natural part of, of that home. But I'm, I'm saying if you haven't been brought up that way, then I think it's much harder to create that or if one person has and the other person has, hasn't had that experience, you then have that, you know, what, what kind of role do you want to assume uh, in your relationship? What is it that you want to be and I want to be and how do we make this work? And who's yeah, in charge? Right. And then we have the mic conversation of no one is in charge and no one needs to be the leader. <laughs> oh, please, <laughs> Let's not go please. there. But no, that happens. No, you, you called him in now. You know he's going to call him. <laughs> Well, I've got one more one on. I don't know if that's still Joe. Joe, you had your hands up, or is that someone else? Hello. Yeah, oh. it's still me. Is there a problem? <laughs> it's still Joe. Joe, did you want to say something? Because you had your hands up. You didn't have your yeah, hands up before. Yeah, I did. Specifically about what you just finished saying. Oh, there shouldn't be any roles. I mean, there should be roles. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, you know. I'm not going to believe that there shouldn't have to be roles, okay? It's a male-female thing. It is not about slaying dragons. It's about two people defining their compatibility and getting together, uh, finding out if they can trust and respect one another, and if they can, then they can. This thing about where you have to assume the male role and female role, you're still pigeonholing people, and you're putting them into positions that they don't have to be in. Good. Yeah, well, well let's ask to... you, yeah. Let's ask you, yeah, because we know what you think, Joe. But let's ask you, yeah, what he thinks. What do you think, you, yeah? In terms of which you guys hit a lot of point. Um, I think it's indicative of part of the issue. It doesn't have to be a leader, uh, you know, and that's what Joe's just been talking about. Um, you know, I, I alluded right. to it in my conversation. But, yeah. So, what do you think? Do you think there needs to be leadership in a relationship? Certainly, but I think the overall dialogue is indicative of what we've been speaking about. Um, you have to remember that we originally were talking about single mothers raising sons, and that turned into a conversation about why men are not real men. And the conversation was held by two women. So I think that right there is part of what some of the challenge is. Um, I don't think either one of you are qualified to say what a man is. You you can speak a no, we're not. What you felt. I don't know. think we said that. So, I don't think um, we discussed that at no, all. No, we didn't say that. We were reflecting on No, we didn't, on disc we didn't discuss that at all. Of, yeah. Yeah, we were reflecting on our experience of growing up in a home where a man assumed a, a, a leadership role and how that affected us. We weren't saying 
that we think men should be any certain way and what defines a man as a man. Yes. Maybe that's something that you and you Joe need to talk about. Did. <laughs> Yes. Thank when, you, Joe? Thank you. When, when did we say yes, that? Before, before I came about, in, you said your father was a man's man. man. That's right. You said in the I said, I have to that, from the experience of the man that I've known. Excuse me, known, and I co-host. Said, you and I are going to have to review <laughs> these terms about being co-host, okay? Well, you're not co-host on Ebony's Real yeah, Talk. I know, I built, know. Okay? But we should, have, we should talk about it. <laughs> I want Joe as co-host. I need Joe. <laughs> we need Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Vote for me because otherwise the mute button will always be an automatic. Okay? The thing Vote is, one. Man. Joe from Montana. Joe Montana. Oh, from Montana. Lord. Right. Montana. Man- yeah, right. <laughs> Montana, Montana, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know it's how they're trying to skip around the subject, you know, of course. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, because of the topic, okay? I am getting to the topic. Let's make it clear, okay? We're not trying to say that a man is the type of man that that we've experienced is a real man. What we were saying is there's a difference between that experience and some of the men you meet who aren't even clear about who they are. Good try, Ebony. Before I got it, yeah, exactly. That's okay, <laughs> you were talking about it in the disparaging tones about you know there shouldn't be any leaders. Well, see, what you've said on various shows that there should be leaders. The man should be the leader. Yes, therefore, I have. The, yes, you have. So therefore, you can't say now that you know. Oh, we weren't saying that about the men. You were saying that about the men. I you wasn't saying men. that. I was not saying that. You too. I'm not leaving you out either, Ross. You don't I was that. not say I was not saying that at all. You didn't say it, but she was doing it in disparaging terms. You happen to agree. Oh, Lord. Oh, and, no. And I'm catching crying. both of you. Get a, get a bit of Sorry. Sorry. Hey, 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 you two girls, okay? <laughs> Excuse-moi. All and right. again, here we are, pitted against each other, and why is that? We were just making some observations about our experiences, exactly. and you guys Good for went into you it. Too. Right, so good why can't we have a discussion too. about it instead of... Very you good, very good. Here, 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 here it is, right here on the line. Two girls trying to get up on one guy, and I'm going to tell you now, you have about four more girls in order for it to be fair. All right? Yeah, come on. Come on, don't go with you. Come on, don't come on. No, I'm not with you. He's absolutely right. He's <laughs> absolutely right. I mean, it was off topic, and I think, I don't know what you guys again, this is to. what... I don't know where you understand, but I know when we started talking, I actually made a comment to Michelle, which was, Michelle, don't you find it really interesting when you meet someone who doesn't seem to have the type of role model in terms of a man that you're used to, so that you were grown up with, and and it there is a real difference. You can tell the difference between a man just like what Galactic Science actually you said a man women, a man who didn't grow up with a man in the home. Different. You actually said a yeah. man doesn't have a father in the home, which is that's, yeah. that's not the same statement. But notice that we didn't say anything about women the entire time. The whole time we were talking, or you guys were talking about men. Oh, but someone in the chat room did say you, something did you, about women. Did you and I read it the part out. Where I, yeah, I, I think I said a lot about um, the women's part in... No, actually, Michelle, what you spoke about was an egalitarian society that existed within the Netherlands and Northern Europe. And the problem with that is that you're not taking into account that whether you're dealing with Australia or whether you're dealing with the U.S., these are countries that were founded and are maintained currently by the violence of patriarchy. So the men are going to respond here differently, and they may be more, more, more macho. They may be more warlike, just like in Australia, because we are currently under duress and political oppression. You don't have the same type of scenarios in Switzerland and the Netherlands. So, it, 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 you know, that wasn't really related to what we were talking about. But you were pushing more an egalitarian agenda, which certainly doesn't work because it shows it right here in this conversation that we're trying to have on the phone where it's going all over the place. And it's not really well, as focused as it should be because well, I, I somebody disagree. hasn't stepped up and said, hey, I'm going to lead the conversation. Of course. Of course, yeah. I, I disagree disagreement. with that. But I, as I a man, I have the strength to stand on my own. Yeah, that's oh, the difference exactly. between a male and a woman. And, and, and I do too. And, and that's, what I'm, that's, that's exactly the point that I was making, is that my experience is that a lot of people don't have that strength to stand in, on their own. That's my, that was my observation. 
What you so, were pushing, especially at me, was that there should be leadership roles as assumed by the man. I'm saying that, the, and, I, and I'm, I knew you would probably disagree with me, I am saying that either a man or a woman can take on a leadership role. Okay, a man who is not insecure is going to say, "Oh, look! If my woman is uh, has a higher IQ than I have, if she has greater decision-making skills than I do in certain areas, um, if, even if she's physically stronger than I am, let's say she's an Olympic athlete, if the man says." I like that about her, and if she doesn't get uptight about the fact that she has certain superior qualities or equal qualities to him, then that then that particular relationship can work. I'm not for leadership roles per se. Okay, if the man wants to take the role and the woman wants to follow, no problem. But I'm also a man who says if the woman has the strength, the moral fortitude, the character to take leadership roles in certain situations, the man, if he wants to follow. No problem with me either. So can we ask a question of the two men on the line? I'm sure I've oh, got this is a loaded one. I mean, we haven't been here long in. enough, but when she's going to say something yeah, like that? Too. Well, she hasn't been here long enough. the machine gun from yeah, under the skirt. Come on, come on, you know, calm no, it's down, It's a loaded okay. question, so, okay, yeah, if you've got <laughs> a bulletproof vest, question. put it on now, all right? <sighs> you, okay. You've got to be I'm around when she does quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question, and the question is, right, what defines a man as a man? And I know that me and Michelle are not qualified to answer this question, so I'm going to ask you guys on the line to define now a you're, man. Now you're what, using what that makes a man? to back out. What make, uh, why are you backing out? I'm not Are you, are you wearing out. panties or something? Come on, oh, what are you backing God, out Oh, God, jeez, yeah. <laughs> my, panties are in a, my panties are in a twist. You know why? <laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> you want me to tell you why? A man. A man. Why, Joe? Okay. Why? Come on. As soon as she finishes her, her little soliloquy, I'll tell both of you. Go ahead, Emma. And why are you wearing you panties? Back. Come on. Oh, panties are gone. Um, if anybody wants to call in, now is the time to call in. 347 oh, And I think the hey, conversation is going to a really good piece. Cause I, I really am now going to get some answers that I've always wanted to have. I want to know what makes a man a man. And because we're talking about raising young males, okay? And we know single moms cannot do that. But, uh, you know, sometimes men need to answer the question. What is it? What makes a man a real man? Yeah, right. yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll let, let the um, the guest answer, and then I'll give my answer. Because, see, when he answers, he won't get bombarded by two freaking women from across the pond. When I oh, answer, Lord. Um, these two oh, will jump on. God. Look, oh, here, already this time. Drama. The same story Drama. every time. Oh, <laughs> see it on you? you? See, you're lucky. You don't have to call in all the time. I see. I see. Yeah. Well, a man is first off, we have to preface it with saying that a man and a woman, these are two designations that are really undefinable because they're constantly changing and transforming as the ages go by. What defined a man in 1943 does not define a man in 2014 because our imperatives and our goals are different. Uh, so one of the things that we can express is just how men have expressed themselves through the ages that have given us some clue as to what their core nature may be but we have to first have know that that core nature is ever changing a man is unbending okay a man is expansive a man is always looking to create okay a man has a sense of um, situational awareness a man has a sense of sequential thinking so you know I do this and this happens that happens that happens and they can think very long range and sequences a man has a talent and ability of circumspection okay uh, a man also has a talent in, the talent and the ability to uh, inspire most importantly to inspire thought he's more cerebral he's more logical he's ha he's more of a linear thinker than a woman who may be more of an abstract thinker so these are just some of the qualities of manhood but one cannot actually define what a man is because the fact that he's ever expanding and ever creating that means he's ever changing and transmutating okay uh, you Jill, just, you just you ruined the script of those two girls i'll tell you that um, thank you, you, yeah. That's why we love you. Um, but I want to hear from Joe. Come on, Joe. We want to hear your definition of a man. A man is a person who's born male, 
and is a responsible human being. He doesn't have to conform to any other type of definition other than just being somebody who knows how to treat his fellow men or women um, with consideration. I was, most people would say with respect, but I think you have to earn respect. I think you should treat people with consideration. You should uh, say good morning, open up doors for both men and women if they're ahead of you. Um, not cause trouble, be responsible, okay? So, a man is a male person who acts responsibly. A female is a female person who was born female, acts responsibly. How they interact with one another should be, as I've said, you know, and it feels like it's down through the ages now, mutual reciprocation. How the man treats the woman in a healthy way, the woman should treat him in a very healthy way in order to engender trust, respect, understanding, support. And I think, you know, it's extremely hard to do. It's something which everybody wants to accomplish, but apparently it's not being done well. Okay, well, let's, let's bring in another man who may want to add something to this conversation. One I more, can't one more. wait to no. the women answer that. <laughs> can't no, wait. thank you, Joe. I, you did really well there. Um, but let's hear from another man as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Can you hear that? The lavish me with yeah. praise, false praise, just you know, thinking that somehow, yeah, I'm gonna listen to this and just go away. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, I, I do think you made some really valid points, and I really embrace all of what you said. But I just want to bring someone else in because we've only got about 13 minutes left of the show, and just anybody who's out there, uh, you know, we will go into overtime a little. But you know, if you want to hear the, the final bits of the recording, then you need to be online. So I would call in three four seven at nine four five seven five five six. Okay. So uh, my next caller, do you want to make a contribution? Um, Hello. Financially, financially. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, I, I can't really speak much. I mean, the brothers touched on 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 a lot of points. You know what I'm saying? Uh, mm-hmm. Pretty much said it in a nutshell. So what is your, what do you think about the whole question of single moms raising Hold young on. males? Hold on. Um, I, I, I give them tremendous respect um, for the ones that were able to, um, you know, maintain the order in the house and, and, and manage, you know, either working a job and, you know, working a job, a second job at home, you know, um, being the mother and the father. Um, mm-hmm. It is, it is, you know, but I think that it's taking a toll on uh, our society. It's taking a toll on women um, with, with, you know, with all the stuff that's going on on this world. I um, definitely need uh, two parents in the household. Um, is it, 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 you know, because it's a lot of pressure for one person. Um, you know, you have multiple responsibilities. So, I mean, you know, some women are the, ma- the mother and the father, you know. You know not that they're yeah. men, but they, they play the role of the man and the woman. Um, and, you know, I mean, responsibility for a man is really is, is the main thing you want to call yourself a man, is being responsible, um, being able to maintain yourself, um, you know, uh, uh, support yourself, and, and be able to take care of, of, you know, your own and others, I would say, you know, in the sense of, you know, your family, uh, be responsible, carry yourself as a mature person, you know, um, and, and, you know, not not get caught up in the things that, that the youth does, you know, because then you're, you're separating yourself from being a man and a boy. So, I mean, I think that everything that comes with being a man is, is you know, is everything total opposite of what being a boy is. Okay. So... You, yeah, I, I want to ask you, because your book is solution-focused, right? So what sure. do you think the solution is to dealing with this issue around single moms raising young males? Okay, we're in a situation where we can't change the way that the world is right now. You know, we're not going to stop these women. Uh, more single mothers coming along because I think, you know, the whole of our society has already been derailed and it's very hard to go back to where we were um, before colonialism or wherever we say that the, you know, the decline started. What do we do now in terms of moving to a solution um, you know, where we can, we can help more people for the future 
to, to create families that are functional um, and that, you know, will have, you know, with these young men will have a smooth or young boys will have a smooth attachment to, uh, you know, adulthood. How does that happen? What's the solution? I say one of the solutions is, you know, because we're looking towards the future, so we actually obviously have to look towards younger generations. And one of the first things that we need to instill in, in young women, I'm going to start there, because women do establish the moral format, structure, and compass for for young men. You know, uh, one of the things that we need to start is is instilling the idea and the knowledge in young women that their vagina is not the most exciting part of them. You know, so um, when we start to cultivate a better mind, OK, that's they don't come immediately with that as an offering. OK, because, again, if you're laying with a boy, he's going to do boyish things. OK, he's going to uh, get you pregnant. He's not going to wear protection or he's going to only look to have some form of pleasure exchange or use you as a tool for orgasm. OK, so that's I'd say number one, because we have to direct it towards towards the youth. Um, also, we need to be uh, a little bit more honest about the reasoning why we have so many single parent households, specifically leaning towards um, women raising young young men and, and also raising young women. You know, why is this such? Is it that every man abandons his home or is that some are pushed out and put in unreasonable situations where they can just no longer be present? whatsoever it becomes a danger to them to even be present you know we really need to take a hard look at that because society has given us this image of the abandoning uh man especially the ab abandoning black man and how he doesn't love his children he doesn't love his wife but his history has not shown us that history has shown us that the black man is one of the most tender sensitive and endearing men on the planet he taught the planet poetry so um I think we need to take a harder look at maybe some of the systems that are in place that keep um, certain people making decisions that would divide and destroy their homes. You know, so solutions would really be us determining what our or, or teaching young people what their self-worth is based on, again, again, their cultural and ethnic origins, learning that worth prior to assuming that the only worth that they have is the ability to make each other orgasm. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the number one solution. Now, as far as the people who are already in uh, situations, uh, the, the women who um, have children, we first have to look at the mindset of those women. Uh, some of them maybe should not have ever had children to begin with. They're not, they don't have the emotional maturity to properly rear and raise children. So to really say, okay, you know, we need to find you a husband that may just now, you know, uh, fuel more dysfunction, you know, so we have to start looking at the individual, you know, are you individually healthy? And is the fact that maybe each parent is not in a child's life? Is this, you know, whose fault is this? It's somebody's fault. Now, ultimately, certainly, like you said, historically, it is the fault of colonialism or the systems that have been put in place in order to destabilize the family unit. Certainly, we certainly do know that. But now, because of those systems that have been put in place, we have certain people who have taken the onus on themselves to use those systems. For instance, here in the States, it's actually, you know, there was a movie that came out many years ago by the name of Claudine with James Earl Jones and Diane Carroll. And uh, Claudine was this woman who had all of these children. James Earl Jones was a garbage man. Long story short, um, he wanted to establish a relationship with her. But whenever her social worker would come to her apartment, he would have to hide in closets or hide the gifts that he bought her because she, the social worker had to ensure that there was no man present. And if there was a man present, then she would cut uh, Claudine's welfare and her benefits. OK, so again, this is one of the dangers of when we establish relationships with each other and we use licensing and we use the state because the state becomes a third party party polyandrous husband in the marriage. And and it's always known that if you act up, I'll get my other husband to kick you out of here and take care of me. So I would say some of the solutions lie in us determining what our our worth is, you know, and instilling that in our children. And inst instilling maybe a more a more concrete 
moral code in our young girls. And I'm not saying that the young men shouldn't be virtuous, but the reality is they don't necessarily have to suffer the same um, repercussions of certain behavior that young girls do. That's just the reality of it. You know, if someone gets present pregnant, it is much easier for the young man to he can move states. His family can move him away. Right. It, it makes it a little easier. So our work has to be with the young girls. And if the young girls set a certain standard, the boys will follow, you know, based on that standard. The girls have to know how to say no. And Women got to value themselves. And, and, and it has to be emphasized at a very young age because you know the way they're exploited you know women young women the way they have uh sexualized young girls um has gotten younger and younger you know um so it's it's almost like you know you're putting them out there in the world in the sense of to see all these different crazy things that's going on you gotta prepare them you know there's there's no preparation sometimes and uh, when they get you know bombarded with all these images and you know uh influences you know, they bounce and go. And then the thing is, um, worshiping money, material things, and looking for, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that old implemented situation, and, and it still lives on now. You know, oh, you got to meet a man with money. You know, uh, no, because, you know, uh, mothers need to teach their daughters, fathers need to teach their daughters to be independent, self sufficient, so they don't have to depend on a man. So, if that time comes and it goes, a woman could walk away. Because a lot of times, too, you know, when, when you're dependent on somebody, then you kind of imprisoned, you know. So um, the main thing is, is, you know, learning independency at a very young age and knowing your worth. You know, that you just don't give away, you know, your, 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 your you know, your, your gifts, you know, if you want to call it, you know what I'm saying? Um, you. Your womb, you. you know, I mean, this, this is not, yeah, you know, I mean, a, a woman is different from a man, a man is different from a woman, um, you know, and, and, and the consequences that come with that, you know, I mean, we, we, we can learn from our past as well, it's like, I mean, it's been going on for so many t years already, you know, and, and generation, generations have gotten even worse, so, you just got to have give them an outlook, kind of educate them, because, again, if you don't educate them, they will be educated on their own. In the streets, through friends, and, and television, television, and radio. So. Yeah, yeah like and I, think, I think there's some responsibility for young men as well. I think, you know, we can't rely just on the young girls to... You know, to have the right thinking, I think young men need to step up and have some respect for themselves as well. That's you know, um, it's not enough that they just go and think they can, you know, stick it wherever. That's all that oh, they're oh, about. No. They need to have a little bit more um, of self-respect as well, and, and think about uses and whatever, and stop doing all the stuff they do. I think there's lots of work on both sides, but I think you know, yes. The girls get pregnant, but the boys also create the babies. Okay, Hold on. so you know okay. they right. both need work. Okay, very good. All right, you're right. <laughs> both men and women, both boys and girls, as they grow up, self-respect will not only teach the boys and girls how to grow with mature men and women with regards to relationships, but with regards to life itself. You have to treat yourself as though you're a valuable human being, which means that you don't accept um, deleterious situations. You don't get involved with women or with men who are not going to do right by you. Now, of course, that's going to depend on the definition. You know, the female definition versus the male definition. Because some females will think, well, I'm dating him for about three or four dates. He now belongs to me. We've talked about that. There are women who think like that. The thing is, is that if a person is not treating you properly, okay, then you don't stay with that person. You are too valuable as a uh, boy, girl, man, woman to be in any kind of relationship with you, regardless of whether it's with um, a personal relationship or a business relationship, where they are not treating you, giving you what you're worth. And what is your worth? If, again, responsibility comes in, you do um, what I guess society would call the norm. You don't hurt other people. You're not malicious. Um, you don't steal, cheat, slander, libel. Um, 
you don't express yourself in a jealous, envious way. Um, you don't. You just not. You're just not malicious. And so that's a form of responsibility. So when you're a person like that, plus when you do find somebody that you value because they are responsible and they like to give, and you like to give, you can form a mutual, um, reciprocal relationship. And I've been beating the drums for for that for as long as I've been on your show. But nobody seems to get the message. I wish some uh, Can I can I say something? Nobody um, in, knows. Can I can I just say, Joe? Um, I completely agree with you, and this goes back to what I was trying to, trying to say before, which I don't think I communicate very well. But I think, generally speaking, we don't hold men accountable and give them responsibility because there's an un- what what that communicates for me is that there's an underlying attitude that you can't. Because you can't be responsible, you're a man, and and it, you know I think you're doing a disservice by, by saying that by saying well, you know men are just going to do that because that's just what they're like. And when no, I no. when I ha- when I have when I have conversations when I have conversations with with my girlfriends about men, I can't tell you how astonished I am to hear. Well, what do you expect? He's a man. You shouldn't expect right, anymore. Nah, that's right, that's right. This is a really, really bad, bad conversation, and this is this. I think is a very common attitude that we hold, and that's why I completely agree with what Joe is saying. It, you know, we've got to teach individually people to take responsibility and appreciate themselves and each other for being human, let alone male or female. And we can't just sit back and say to people, "Well, you know." That's what men do. It's, it's okay. You just, you, you're going to have to take the responsibility. I think that's really um, dysfunctional. Well, I've well, got okay. got someone in the chat room saying, ABC, welcome to the show, ABC. But uh, I think he's gone off and he's made some great points. Um, <clears throat> who's going to prepare these women? Uh, the mama can't oh. do it by herself. It's the daddy who that's sets right. the rules. Two the pounds. Parents. That's true. <laughs> right? Um, sounds kind of soft. And I think that, uh, I think he was talking about Joe. Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think he's right in some ways. Uh, what's the answer, guys? Who's going to prepare these women? And the women mm-hmm. can't do it by themselves. And, exactly. you know, there's a male role in the whole of this. That's what I'm saying. Men need to step up, you know. And and, and when I said that on the women, the reason why I said in regards to the women is because, again, the woman ends up, you know, bearing the consequences on a full scale of what's been happening. But, I mean, you know, not to to take anything away or give too much to any male. Um, In general, yeah, men need to step up. We have, uh, you know, um, a crisis of men, you know, just... Um, feel that they just be with women, get them pregnant, and then, you know, can move on with a no conscience at times. Um, and that's not every case, but I'm just saying for some that are a lot, you know, where they have the difficulties or they knew their intention wasn't to be in a long-term relationship, yet, you know, they have a sex with our condoms or they, you know, ejaculating in the woman. I mean... So it definitely has a responsibility, you know, you as a man. I mean, before you, you dip in, you know, dive, you've got to know what's the consequences and are you ready for the responsibilities. And if you're not, then take precaution. doesn't mean that you don't have sex. You know, you handle it a different way. Um, you know, people having multiple partners and just having babies here, having babies there with no con- no regard. You know, and then, you know, then don't, you don't expect the government to get involved. You know, you upset because the government gets involved. I mean, we got to start taking, again, responsibility for self. We got to clean our own house. Stop letting the television raise your children. You know, because, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah, we get influences from the youth. The youth are watching what the TV is watching. Then they t- teach other kids. The, the kids learn from the, from the adults. I mean... It, you okay. know, it's talking about adults. Okay, Jay, thank you. I just want to bring someone else in who wants to make a comment. And I know NT, you're waiting. I'm going to bring you straight in after. Okay, 9235, do you want to make a comment? Uh, yes, I'd like to make a comment. Um, 
I like to make a comment that's actually referring to black women. You know, we always say the, you know, that black women is keeping the man away from the kids and things like that. And the whole thing, the downfall of black family is because the black male is not stepping up to do the job that he's supposed to do. That's the main reason why it's come to happen right now. I know a guy who's 25 years old, has four kids. 25 years old, has four kids. Not taking care of any of those kids. Is it the woman's fault because she laid there and had the baby? It's the man's fault because he knew that he was he, that it was a chance that he can have an offspring for what they were doing. And then when he came, he didn't take care of that kid, so he left and went with another lady. Now that kid's going to grow up without a dad, without somebody there to show him what he needs to do to be a man. You're just not a man because God said you're a man, so you're a man. It's, it's, it's in your mind that what a man is. And so, like I said, the downfall of the black family is because the black man is not stepping up to take care of his job, to do what he needs to do right now. And that's what I think about it, 100%. Okay. Uh, Yuya, what do you think? Do you want to comment on that? I think the last caller was absolutely right in many senses. Uh, technically and historically, culturally, racially, the man is always the problem solver. You know, regardless of, and probably that point was missed that I that I made earlier about instilling a better uh, moral code in our young girls, and I still stand on that because it's it's what needs to happen. The reality is the only people who can or persons who can fix this are the men because that is our nature. I know we're speaking about uh, on this show we're speaking about how everyone is just energy, and um, we're kind of this homogenous blob of unisexuality, but. Um, that's why that's a part of the sickness of the world right now that type of thinking that that's what i'm going to say on that um we we were born with certain gender assignments so that we can perform certain functions that were made easier based on our gender assignment so the caller was absolutely right it is the man's fault and men are not stepping up to be men for various reasons some just find it easier not to some are being squashed in their manhood they're being sent to jail sent to detention the principal's office so forth and so on um so he's absolutely right in that but then there's also a responsibility on the woman it's not a one-sided thing the woman has to be responsible for what enters inside of her because if she's not responsible for what enters her vagina she's not going to be totally responsible for what exits her vagina and wow. that's what we right. in the community. That's deep. I like, I like that analogy. That's true. Simple politics. Simple. Okay. Well, you got to think about it like this, too. N2 in. Let, let me bring... Let, sorry. Let me just bring N2 in, because I know he's been waiting patiently, and I need to give him a segue, okay? N2's on. N2. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Patrick. Hey, how you hey, no. Great show. Um, love the comments. Now, I, I do understand that this, the, the whole subject matter is around, I, I guess it's the black family, if I'm correct, and then it kind of expanded into oh, the whole paradigm. Of the, okay, so it's the whole paradigm of the male-female relationship and yeah. how it's structured. Now, I can only speak of what goes on because I know people listen from all around the world, so I can only reflect on what goes on here in the United States. Um, the term that I like to use, which was coined quite some time ago, is called gender bending, which has probably been going on in this country for a good, oh, 30 years uh, from my observation to where there's this complete deconstruction of the nuclear family. And when I hear comments like, okay, well, you know, the the man needs to step up. I always try to keep that in its proper context. And just to use an example of what I'm talking about, here in America, when we are given the, the idea of the black man, we're, we're always given it in complete and total extremes. Either we get the black male who's the entertainer slash musician, movie star, uh, filthy rich entrepreneur, or we get the diametrically opposed black male who is standing on the corner, slinging okay. dough, 
got the gun, got the gun in his hip. And from my experience in growing up, majority of black men are somewhere in between those two. And they are just completely invisible in the whole discussion. And it always blows my mind how they just always get left out of these types of discussions. The, the, there are so many black men as well as men who actually do the right thing, who attempt to do the right thing. But when you live in a society that we live in today that completely emasculates men, completely, and to, to not take that into consideration and think that men don't feel this, feel that their own self-worth has been compromised by a system and a government and a culture that they live in, I think it does a great disservice to the discussion. And yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Well, I'd like to say this. Okay. That, um, you know, I, I don't believe, I, well, I'm just saying my, you know, from coming from me, that's not true. Because you know what? I am talking about the black man who's in the middle. I'm not talking about the guy standing on the corner with the gun. I'm not talking about the guy who's the entertainer. I'm talking about the everyday guy who goes out and meets these girls and they're not taking care of their responsibility. With all the teenage pregnancies right now, with all the uh, unwed mothers right now, with all the dysfunctional families right now, where do you think that comes from? That's not coming from the top entertainers yeah. or from the um, from the little guys on the street. That's coming from those young men, and I say black men, it's probably men mm. too, but I can only talk about black men because that's what I am. Right, right. The doctor, the, the, the doctor. And the middle yeah. ones, those yeah. are the ones, the general public are the ones that are growing up that are not being men. I'm not talking about this. How about this? How about this? Guys. How about how about the the rich guy that has everything, or or not even a rich guy in general that that this society has put money in front of everything. So you with money you can do anything. You can disrespect people. You can have as many as women as you want. You know things like that also have part to play into that. Right, but the my I think my point got lost. The point that I was trying to make is that when 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 we phased out the nuclear family when when men started becoming emasculated in the public eye whether it be via the media or however that whole situation goes down all i'm saying is that is that these are contributing factors right. to what you guys are talking about that's all i'm saying i'm not saying i'm not absolving I agree, I the middleman i'm not absolving that middle guy who really makes up that the, the majority of the population from his responsibility that i wasn't the point i was trying to make i was just saying that i think that it's important to include things that contribute to this or that type of mentality as well men not feeling their self-worth and and that that was the only point that i was trying to make it's like it, it, you can't look at it in a vacuum in other words yeah, well i am going to absolve the man because number one if it's not rape and it's consensual and when it's consensual the girl also knows what can happen because it's her body she has the veto power. She could have said no at the beginning. She could have said no at the end. She could have had the abortion. This isn't back in the 50s where you had a hanger and you scraped out um, inside from inside the uterus. She had the choice. Now, when there are deadbeat dads who, who make promises and they don't keep their promises, they are deadbeat dads and they should be held responsible for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for the babies they bring to the world. But if, they, if the guy says, look, you're just the one night stand. And she says, okay. And then they get together. He doesn't use protection because she says, hey, it's not a problem. And then she gets pregnant. She knows she's gotten pregnant. She's got nine months, or let's say six months, I mean six weeks, so, uh, so that she can um, have, the, uh, have the abortion. And she could have done it. She didn't do it because she didn't want to. Now, all the other people are going to say, oh, well, she's under stress. And society says, bullshit. She had the choice. She didn't take the choice. I'm not going to put the onus on the man. Well, I'm just thinking about 
But just think about this thing, okay? She was a, she did have the choice. But just think, if she, you know, the girl who's growing up, who's giving it out to everybody because they said she looked good or they love her. Just think, she probably grew up without a father. She probably grew up without someone to tell her what she's worth and how she's worth and what she should do and what what is expected of her. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you still go back to the leader of the family, and that's what the pro- that's what the problem is. Well, the fact that you don't have that leader of the family out there. The fact that you don't have that leader of the family. Exactly. You, you don't have lady. a new for your family. I agree with you. But the woman, even if she has poor self-esteem, after she's had the first kid or the second kid, <laughs> after that, she's got three or four kids. She's got it because she wants them. Well, it don't matter if she had two kids. Those two kids are going to grow up without that family, without that father. Her choice. There. And guess what? Then there go two of them like this. Exactly That's right. Her choice. Her and you know what? And so is. And then it's a lot of us right now that are saying, oh, baby, I love you, I love you so much, oh, you're so beautiful, you, you know what, she was grew up, and she grew, grew up without a lot of self-esteem, so she's thinking, wow, this guy really digs me, he really wants me, all he wants is some butt, and he gets the butt, and he's gone again, you know what I mean, so, well, how many times this. does she have to do that before she wakes up, she got, it, just put it like she's this. got the entertainment industry to tell her to put a ring on it. Oh, what if she did it once? What if she only did it once? That she young did girl, it once. She now, no, well, like I said, the guy, no. the guy that said, I love you. That young girl's going to grow up. It don't uh, matter. If she, if she did it once and she had a baby, that one girl's going to grow up. I'm agreeing with you on that one. Without the family, without the self-esteem. So, you know, it's not all on the woman, I'm agreeing like I with you on that one. Yeah. If she's got a guy who's yeah. lying to her. I, I just want to I just wanna check you guys. You, yeah, is it okay for you guys to be talking about a woman in the way that oh, they're talking go. about women? Here we go. 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 Here we the last five minutes we've been sitting having Man, a and show. I tried to jump on both of you, but you, but you practically <laughs> muted me. You interrupted me to bring in other people. Who are you kidding? Well, I think the difference here is that you, you ask for solutions. I think that's the difference. You ask for solutions, and everyone who's calling is providing solutions. So we're actually on topic, whereas you and Michelle went somewhere else on the personal thing about men. So it's different. It's not the same thing. Were men giving solutions to what women should be doing? And when we were talking about what we thought about men, we were kind of, you know, we were stressed about it. You know, maybe I'm in a different place because I'm in a different place because when we're talking about women, I'm actually talking about young girls. Uh, so I'm, I maybe everyone else was talking about women. I'm talking about our young girls like how do we father them how do we guide and lead them so these are the solutions that i'm giving i'm not even speaking about adult women yeah because we can't really do much about adults you know but uh how do we again like i said establish a better parameter of worth in our young girls and instill in them that the that their their vagina is not the most exciting thing about them so i'm talking about our babies if when i say women i'm speaking of young girls also Okay, so if we if we're saying our young girls, our young men, are not getting this in the home, where do they get it? Where do they get this role modeling? Because somewhere they've got to learn, you know, the way to be. And are, are you suggesting in this book that there needs to be more community effort to kind of mentor and support our young people? I don't know. I haven't read the book. Well, but is that what you're that, talking about? That goes about? without saying that. that it goes without saying that every child belongs to the community, but the challenge here is identifying the community, which I do go into in the book. Uh, again, as I said earlier, each person is a community unto themselves. And amongst all the people that we have here on the phone, and I can hear that several, just by the tonality and the inflections of the voices, I can hear that several are melanated. So can we say that we're all a part of the same community? I would think not, because in my community, the man takes the, the lead and the woman follows. But Joe doesn't do that in his community i don't have a problem with that that just means that we are functioning from two different community paradigms no problem so what's important for us is to establish who actually is a member of our community before we even say should the community step up because some of the ideas that are even being espoused tonight i wouldn't expose my daughter to these ideas you see so i think the solution needs to begin more there community rearing before we even rear children 
we have to rear the backdrop. And has we read the community? Has we read the community? Ritual rites of passage in common definitions. For instance, just like Joe Joe is is expressing one perspective, I'm expressing another perspective. Uh, we are now determining that our definitions of certain things are complete. Like you asked us to define what a man is. I said one thing. He said another thing. These are the things that help us to discern if we should be a part of the same community or not. And once we determine those things, we find other people who share our common definitions. And more importantly, not just our common definitions, but our common imperatives. Okay, and once we can determine those common imperatives, goals and objectives, then we can start establishing certain communal rituals that strengthen the bonds of community. But that's that's where it begins. And that may only begin inside of yourself. One of the first things you have to be able to do is to resolve and come to terms with all the things that you are. And once you can unify yourself, then you can look for other people who are also unified. But part of the issue that we're speaking about here with the whole single mothers or fathers running out, we're talking about broken people. So we don't necessarily, you know, we're not going to be able to join community and have a big kumbaya circle and saying we are the world with people who are broken and are like scared animals in a corner who are just leech launching out and hurting anyone who comes near them. That's not going to happen. So we need to align and become a community within ourselves first. And that starts with identifying the different components of self. Like ego, drive, emotions, all these different things that we've seen at play tonight on this show. How do we organize them and get them working on one functional accord? Then we can start with community rearing. And until that happens, no one should even be allowed to have children. If we could, if we could find a way to stop that. Yeah. Well, I think it used to be a village, a village raised the family, and the, the village was the family, you know, the cousins, the aunts, the uncles, the aunties. My dad wasn't around when I was growing up, so I grew up, you know, thinking like, okay, I want to be like all the other guys in my neighborhood, you know, I want to sell drugs, I want to, you know, uh, have ladies all around, I want to drive the big cars. But then I had other people who I went to, my cousins, the guys down the street who were pretty sharp guys who had jobs. It, it, it was the neighborhood, it was the people, and all those people had a lot of the same values. So that's how it was raised. Right now, you're saying, you know, like you're different than the other guy, what's his name, Joe? That, you know, that, yeah. but you guys can still help each other out. It doesn't have to be a certain community and you, everybody feels the same way. Everybody knows that you have to, um, you have to raise the, the kids right, you know, and that's how it should be. Okay. I think we've kind of come to the end of our time. I, I know we've had such a great conversation tonight, and I'm really going to thank Yuya. I know his phone dropped, and he's not going to get back in because we're in overtime. I um, just want to thank Yuya for his contribution tonight because it was so interesting to have such an intelligent conversation that was so rich with information and knowledge and wisdom, and I just learned so much, and I know you guys would too, so go back and listen to the podcast again. And there's so much information in there, um, I'm sure, uh, that we can all learn from it. Uh, just going to say that, you know, there's still so much in that book that he talks about that I probably will invite him back next week if he's around to come back and talk some more. I'm sure we'd love to hear more from him. And uh, just want to thank everybody who's been on tonight. We have been into overtime, but um, I'll be back on Thursday, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern, and that's Global Village Dating Night with Joe, my co-host from Montana, okay, on Montana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with me on mm -hmm. Thursday. So I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation tonight. Just thank you to everybody who was in the chat room, uh, all my esteemed uh, co-hosts, uh, well, hosts from other shows, because there's so many people who host other shows who were on, who were listening in tonight. All the guests that were in as well. Thank you, everybody who was listening. Um, really enjoyed having you as part of this tonight. So it was a really great night for me. I was tired, but I've been energized by the conversation. Um, and thank you to Joe, to uh, Andrew, to Michelle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's Wait not forget, for Joe. You know, we know the mm -hmm. egos on this show. We know the egos. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you, uh, and there it is. Nine, two, three, five to Jay. Thank you, Jay, for uh, calling in as well. Uh, great conversation. I don't know. I, I've got to let you guys go. 
I hope it's not too much for you, Joe, but I'll let you go. I'll let you go. Yeah, for um, God's sake. Can't my goddamn <laughs> name get off of... You know what? You're spreading my name around. Everybody's talking now. Two guys have mentioned my name already. I've never even talked to before. <laughs> uh, oh, dear. Mm. Well, you're becoming famous because not many people really knew much about you before I started calling your name. So there you go. That's life. <laughs> Wait till I get a show. I sure the hell hope you're my co-host. But I am going to do it. You're going to do it. Oh, man. Hey, Joe. See you later, Joe. Yeah, Goodbye, all right. Joe. Good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, we're, just... I'm playing you out with a little bit of reggae. It's by Taurus Riley. And it's for all those women out there who don't know what their status is and don't understand how great they are. You are absolutely royal, and this song is all about women being royal and treated and respected by men as being royal beings. So, Taurus Riley, she is royal. Enjoy, and I shall see you guys on Thursday. Much love to everybody online tonight. Enjoy.